How's it going everybody? Back to doing another live stream. Um, I find it amusing that I am doing a video on this topic. Uh, I know a lot of people who follow my channel will know how I feel about the Artificer. And therefore, um, why am I doing a best cantrips video on the Artificer? Well, it's really to complete the series. Uh, my intention was to make sure I made a best cantrips for all the different classes and the Artificer is a class uh, whether it's played in your game is sort of beside the point it's a class okay um, i thought this was actually going to be a really easy video to construct when i looked at it i thought okay that's pretty easy i've done lots of these before it's going to be a piece of cake to put together frankly it didn't turn out to be that way um, i was really really surprised because i thought it would be easy but i had been told from some of my friends that the Artificer is actually one of the more complex classes. I did not think that cantrip um, selection would be an issue though. All right, so uh, this is, my live stream is gonna have the, uh, the start time down in the description once YouTube uh, publishes the video publicly. Hi, hopefully is a high definition version, but if it does not, then it will get released as a mm, whatever. Basically, if I have to wait too long, I will just do the edited version. Um, anyway. Uh, the start time will go down there once um, they've published it uh, to the general public and I'm ready to sort of uh, make those alterations and stick in the start time. Uh, hi, how's it going Nick? How's it going um, F Hubber? And hi Fender, how's it going? Um, so other than that, you will find that the live stream stays public or will be public. It will stay public until I do my edited version, which cuts, cuts the front and the back. So all the Q&A is eliminated from the live stream, so it will be gone. Okay, uh, that, therefore, if you want to access the live stream specifically, subscribe, hit the bell button, turn on notifications, or uh, you can be a patron and get access to the live streams, because I always do that, and I also provide them with my notes, so if they want to have a written version, they can have that, plus whatever else I might put out from time to time. <clears throat> Now, um, the live stream will stay public until the edited version is released. Now, if you haven't been part of my live streams before, normally what I do is I read from my notes. I have about three and a bit pages, so it's not a particularly huge amount of information. And um, surprisingly, I have some advice about things you should probably not take as well. I didn't expect to have that in there, but apparently um, it seemed like a sensible thing to do. <clears throat> so I, I show you slides, I go through my notes, and once the presentation's finished, we go back to the webcam and we have a discussion. You can ask questions, give feedback. Hey, you can disagree with me. Or we can talk, talk about something other than the artificer or cantrips. It doesn't have to be the topic for today. It can be anything you like. <clears throat> yes, I would believe it. I can believe that, Tim Hubba, absolutely. Um, is that Tim Bragan? Bragan, if I got your, uh, your name wrong, I do apologize. Bragan 76. Okay, so um, grab some food, get settled down. We've got a little bit to go through, and hopefully this will be useful to you. Uh, I would get some food, some drink, and make yourself comfortable. Because I'm doing that right now. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Wheeler and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons 5e because I usually do talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And we could be talking about the Artificer Party, but we're not. The topic for today is the best Artificer cantrips in Dungeons and Dragons 5e. What are they? I thought I would find a video on this topic on YouTube. And I was shocked to discover there isn't one. So, I'm making one. So, everything is taken from the updated Artificer in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Now, you can find all that information on page 9, 10, 11, and 12, if you are interested about exactly where you will find it. I did a bit of research on it. I took information from there and from other locations. So what are the best Artificer cantrips to take in Dungeons & Dragons 5e? The first thing is we need to actually break down some of the restrictions we have with the Artificer and what we can take. And I thought I would go through that just quickly so you've got an idea of where I'm coming from because our selection will be restricted. Okay, the first thing is Artificers start with two cantrips 
and eventually get a total of four cantrips. So it's, it's not a lot. Uh, in terms of the other classes, you are probably at the tail end, um, the most restrictive in terms of the number of cantrips you can access. Therefore, your selection needs to be very careful, otherwise you're really not going to be able to do very much, uh, particularly at low level. At higher level, it doesn't really matter too much because you've got other spell slots. But at low level, it's a bit more difficult. I would recommend selecting one damage dealing cantrip and the better utility cantrips that are available to the artificer. There is a line of thought that probably, I don't think I would disagree with it, it is possible to go without taking any damage dealing cantrips for an artificer. And if you have a look at some of their features, which I'm not going to explain, you could do it, but it would be a special build as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, artificers get very few cantrips, as I said, but they get a wide selection of great cantrips. Not just good cantrips, but great cantrips to choose from. And as a result, we can take our pick quite nicely and get some of the best cantrips available in the game as far as I'm concerned. Which is excellent news, makes life much easier for you and for me. Here are the cantrips I would recommend for the Artificer in this order. Now there is some room for movement, but I'm going to list them in the order that I would normally take them if I was playing this particular class, rather than somebody else, okay, based on whatever they're doing. The first one is Guidance, because it's like one of the best spells out there, best cantrips you can get. And you will use it frequently, as I've said on many occasions. It will improve the success on a wide range of actions and tasks, more than any other spell is probably going to do. And it's really simple to use. Now for anybody who says, ah, it's not a great spell because I forget to use it all the time, that's not really the fault of the description of Guidance and that particular cantrip. That is just people forgetting to use it. And if you're forgetting to use it, then stick a four-sided dice in front of you so you are reminded that it's a special colour, reminded to use it when you can. And there will be many occasions when you can. So you get to add one D4 or a four-sided dice to any ability check or skill check. That is a huge number of rolls, including initiative, up to one minute. Now the thing is, trying to get initiative, <laughs> guidance on initiative, is pretty hard. Um, and to be fair, I imagine there will be a few dungeon masters who will shut that down, but there is the possibility of doing something like that. So that's selection number one. Number two is definitely, for me, going to be Firebolt, because frankly, fire solves most problems. Um, I am also incredibly biased with regard to setting things on fire and using fire. It is one of the most common things that monsters are resistant to, but there's also, I would say, a very strong line of thought to suggest that you do not need to even take Firebolt and you could select something else completely different. But for me, I would take it simply because I can cause trouble, um, which of course is not necessarily something a dungeon master wants, all the other players want, but it also solves a lot of problems. Fire always seems to do that. So what does this thing do? It has a long range for a cantrip of 120 feet, it ignites objects, and it burns monsters for 1d10 fire damage, or a 10-sided dice worth of fire damage, and it scales, which is great. Given again, cantrips are not normally the best way to do damage and there are usually better ways to do that than using a cantrip. But if you are casting spells and you don't have a weapon and uh, this seems like a better option, then go with it. Okay, selection number three. Mage Hand, because it's really simple to use. And you will use it frequently for many different things. And it's such an easy spell or cantrip to use. The level of skill required by the player is minimal and even if you're not really sure how to use it and where to use it and in what way you don't have to worry about that anymore because I made a video on clever uses of mage hand so I give you pretty much spill the beans and give you everything you might need to know about it so don't have to worry about that you'll do fine you can perform basic manipulation of an object 
weighing up to 10 pounds, no more than that, it's got to be 10 pounds or less, or you might be able to manipulate the environment, as long as it's within the weight restriction, at a range of 30 feet, which pretty much eliminates that 10 foot pole that we used to use in Dungeons and Dragons. Not to saying that you there aren't times when you should have a 10 foot pole, but Mage Hand has become like the, the new 30 foot pole, uh, frankly, and it's a good spell, so not having it would suck. Selection number four, Prestidigitation. Absolutely impossible to uh, pronounce correctly without botching it usually, uh, but I would select this because it is the universal magic tool in Dungeons and Dragons 5e, and pretty much for any version of Dungeons and Dragons, because of all the different things you can do with it. And I'm going to go through them very, very briefly because I've gone over these things on many occasions already, and that is you can manipulate effects like colour, flavour, you can chill something, you can warm something, you can clean something up, you can soil an object, or you can soil the goblin's pants if you really feel like it. You can light and extinguish a small flame. It can't be too big. You're not going to be um, <laughs> mucking around and setting things uh, on fire like the castle. No, it's going to be smaller than that. You can create sensory effects, non-magical trinkets, and small illusionary images. Not quite as powerful as minor illusion in terms of the illusionary effects, but all of the other things that it can do make up for that. Which is why a lot of people um, have a bit of an argument between which is more useful, minor illusion, mage hand, or prestidigitation. And frankly, I don't think it really matters because they're all really good at what they do. So if you can take them, take them all. Okay, what are good alternative cantrips in the player's handbook? My first point of call is always going to be the player's handbook because usually the best cantrips are still in the player's handbook. I've selected two. I've selected a utility um, cantrip and a damage dealing cantrip for those of you who want to make things um, go ouch. So the first one I've selected as an alternative that you could use to replace something like say Firebolt or any of the other cantrips if you don't want them. And that is something like Message. Because whispering a message or um, a conversation over a long distance, it's not going to be much of a, um, a message, it's quite short really, but you can whisper it over a long distance, it reduces the chance of being heard, which means you are less likely to become the next monster meal, which is why we want to use this, and allows for a lot more stealth in your game. It's half the reason why people take it, is to make sure that they don't get heard and it's a bit of a bummer when you have to run back and forth from the party to wherever you've been scouting, if that's in fact what's going on. This spell passes through solid barriers, by the way, uh, as long as you know the target. If you know the individual or creature that you're communicating with, with message, it will pass through a solid barrier, up to a range of 120 feet. That's pretty impressive. A lot of the cantrips require line of sight or... Do not go through total cover. Don't go through barriers. And message does, which is why it's certainly there as an alternative. I think it's a great spell. Okay, the second alternative would be Ray of Frost. It's all right as a damage dealing cantrip. But here's the thing. It's the creature's movement slowing by 10 feet that really makes it significant. And this is why I've selected it. It was really hard because for Ray of Frost and Frostbite, which quite easily could have been my next selection because of the benefits of using Frostbite, but I still feel that Ray of Frost is a better option. Uh, and there will be some contention around whether that would have been the best selection as an alternative, but it'll be up to you. I'm giving you the ones that I think are the better ones. The ones that I would see being used at my table by my experienced players. It's got a medium range, Ray of Frost, of only about 60 feet. So it's not great in terms of range, but it's not terrible. It can freeze a monster uh, doing 1d8 cold damage. Now, it doesn't mean it freezes it solid, but it does 1d8 or an 8-sided dice worth of cold damage, and it does scale up. Again, scaling up is useful, but not necessarily going to be where you want to be because artifices can make 
magic weapons with infusions. And so that changes the whole ball game. Hence why I'm saying something like damage dealing cantrips may not necessarily be something you want to bother with because you don't really need them if you've got a weapon that you've made that's magical. There are no cantrips in Xanathar's Guide to Everything that I think are worth your while, that are worth your time, personally. I had a good hard look and I compared them with the ones that I had selected and I just did not think that there was anything in Xanathar's that would be worthwhile picking up. I also looked at the ones in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything that are also available. Again, I don't think they're worth considering as an artificer uh, unless you have a very specialized character build. If you have a very specialized character build, then maybe some of those other cantrips in those source books would be useful to you. Or if you are, you know, highly skilled in one of the cantrips that I've left off this list. Sometimes they're just people who are really good at using a particular type of cantrip because they've just got really clever ideas. In this case, I didn't think they were really worth it myself. Okay. Some cantrips I would suggest you stay well away from, frankly because of the nature of an artificer. Now, cantrips like magic stone and mending aren't very useful to an artificer because of their low level class features. Now, I can't believe I'm saying this, okay? Um, I'm not necessarily somebody who picks up magic stone as a cantrip. I feel like there are better ways of doing damage than using uh, magic stone. But usually I have a strong affinity and belief in picking up something like mending. But with the nature of an artificer and the class features available to them, I just don't see any point. So unless you have a dungeon master who's quite restrictive in how your artificer's features can be used, which frankly I'm not sure how that would work because they are so, they're so broad, you can do so much with it, I wouldn't bother with Mending and Magic Stone. Oh, God, I can't believe I just said that. I can't believe I did say that. I did it. I did. I said that. Okay. Artificers miss out on Minor Illusion. And for those of you who don't know, it's one of my favorite cantrips. I've recently done a video on Minor Illusion and how to use that. So did Trent Monk. It's a bit of a bummer, but we can live with it. You still get access to some of the best cantrips in the game. And frankly, if something like Guidance was available to more classes, it would probably start sitting up at the top of my, uh, the very top of my list in terms of the best cantrips. But because it's quite restrictive in terms of what classes can pick up Guidance, it's never got there for me. And I've always gone more for Minor Illusion because Minor Illusion is available to a lot of different classes and you also can do a lot with it. But still a bummer, you can't use it as far as I'm concerned. Now, if you found this video helpful and informative, fantastic. That's great news. As it happens, I have a best cantrips for all the different classes in Dungeons & Dragons 5e. And you're welcome to go and check those out if you want to. If you're not into that particular topic right now, I have videos for Dungeon Masters and players. Hundreds of them covering Dungeons & Dragons and Dungeons & Dragons 5e and you're welcome to go and check those out. If you want to support the channel so I keep doing video content like this, you can do that through Patreon, the Amazon affiliate links down in the description, or the merchandise shelf underneath my videos, or just watch my videos, that's fine too. Make sure to share, like, and subscribe, hit the bell button to be notified when I go live, and when I publish new videos, and surprisingly, I, I live stream a lot. Anyway, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Okay, let's check my eyes today, and um, for those of you who stick around, I'm probably going to explain a little bit more about why I selected some of these cantrips, just really briefly. I didn't really want to go into a lot of detail, because the Artifice is actually quite a complicated um, class, and I wasn't completely aware until I had a good hard look at it. And then I, I realized why I had chosen not to go and pick it up um, and, and put it into my game. I, I knew what my res rationale was, but once I saw the new updated version of it and just in all its glory, and, and frankly, 
um, the artificer is a terrifying um, class to consider in terms of how it would affect your game. I feel it's much more appropriate for a steampunk campaign where making things is going to be something you would do. Um, the other thing is, I would say too that Eberron is really the, the place that this sits. For me, Artificer is you know, part of the world of Eberron. I know they wanted to decouple it and make it available to all of the different um, worlds that there, there are, but for me, it's still an Eberron class, something suitable to them. Okay, let's get my, my eyes uh, eyes on. Let's see if this is actually... Oh, oh, my eyes are working. The, the glasses are working. Okay, I've already said hi to Nick. And um, I've said hi to Haba and Fender. Uh, yes, I do... Yes, what is, it, what is it with the ads? I don't have to watch an ad this time. I do appreciate... Thank you, YouTube. Just say thank you, YouTube, for not setting up an ad just as I was about to run the live stream. It's quite frustrating sometimes uh, <laughs> um, and I think I also said hi to um, Bragan76 hi Pat Pat I hope you got my message um, on Patreon and like I said just by all means feel free to throw me a message that way if there's something that pops up and if I can figure out how to make a video on it then I will um, that's probably the best way to get hold of me when you're a patron. Um, so Fendar and um, Pat are, are patrons. They support me um, every month so that I can keep doing this sort of thing. And it helps contribute. But, you know, a lot of people contribute in different ways. You know, whether you're watching the videos and you're watching the ads, you support the channel. And if you're doing the Amazon affiliate link thing, well, you know, that supports the channel as well. So there's lots of different ways. Okay. Um, overboard DM. Hi, Joe. Disagree with you. Never. Ah, uh, look, look, you can disagree with me. You know, uh, I have been very concerned recently. I don't know what it is on the internet. Um, is it just in the States? I don't think it's just in the United States. I think it's kind of across the world. Um, but the internet and YouTube, these seems to be this sort of thing going on where if you disagree with some somebody, there needs to be some sort of war taking place between you, which I, I don't understand. Um you know, I've seen people do character builds and selections of spells that I would not have agreed with, but they've made them work because they knew what they were doing. And hence, you know, you can't do or disagree with what works for them. If I used their character build and their spell selections, I would do very poorly in the game. I have selected um, Dungeons & Dragons 5e cantrips that are much more designed for a very generic artificer that isn't got a specialised build, where you're not multi-classing and picking up feats and other things like that. There's not a lot going on. There's already enough going on in this thing as it is. Um, anyway, and we will discuss some of the uh, rationales as to why I said no to mending and no to um, Magic Stone very shortly. Somebody's already picked up on it, though, by the looks of it. Um... I guess mending and mage hand are must. No, I think, as I said, um, mending probably isn't a must. Mage hand, I, I would, I feel that mage hand is a must. Um, but you know, it depends on how you play the game. It's so useful, mage hand. Mending is one of those things that's really useful when the right situation arises. And when when the right situation arises, it's like the best thing. But then if you are somebody who can make magic items, the chances are you can do a lot more. And I will explain that very, very shortly. Um, Janchevic, how's it going? Magic Stone can be useful for other characters. Yes, Magic Stone can be useful for other character classes by all means. But because the Artificer, and I guess since we're, we've already started this discussion, so let's I'll open the book to page... Uh, not nine. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to take the glasses off because I cannot read at that distance and then to the book. It won't won't work. So <clears throat> one of the things and rationales why I decided that something like Magic Stone was not the right selection 
is I saw what was going on with this class. Now they can make a, magic, a magical trinket, but it doesn't do very much. It does very small things, right? So that's not the big issue. I was surprised to see they were a ritual caster, but also quite pleased because I think ritual casting is awesome and everybody should have it. <laughs> um, but what I noticed was they have this thing, when it comes to mending, they have artificer um, specialist, okay? I believe it's here. Um, oh, here we go, under there. There is the right tool for the job. That's what sold me, and I thought, okay, the right tool for the job, you get that at level three. And this is why you would only have level one and two where mending would be really useful. I want to explain, I'm just going to read the section out. You've learned how to produce exactly the tool you need with thieves' tools or artisan tools in hand. You can magically create one set of artisan tools in an unoccupied space within five feet of you. This creation lasts one hour of uninterrupted work, which can coincide with a short or long rest. Through the um, product of the magic, the tools are non-magical and they vanish when you use this feature again. So for me, I'm thinking, well, now you can just make whatever tool you need to fix something. As long as you have the, the resources and materials, why would you need to worry? I mean, mending is convenient because it would be quick rather than the time frame required to do this. But I also kind of feel that if you're doing this, then people are going to say, okay, but are you proficient with those tools? I kind of feel the artificer thematically, whether it says it raw, but thematically, you know, rules as intended, I think that when using this feature, I think the intention is they would be proficient with whatever tool they create to do whatever they want to do. Um, and I could be wrong, but I feel that's what's going on here. And so much of this is essentially, you know, your ability to make magic items. And one of the huge bonuses to something like mending is the ability to fix a magic item. Now, if you can make a magic item, why would you not be able to fix a magic item without using mending. I think it makes sense that you would be able to do that. Okay, so that was the, one of the reasons why I said don't worry about mending. Then I was walking my way through here, and <clears throat> I <laughs> thank you, Joe. Thank you, Overboard DM. He has a YouTube channel, by the way, and you should absolutely go and check it out. He has some great stuff on miniatures and terrain. Um, <laughs> and I say that just about every single live stream he shows up, and for those of you who are wondering uh, whether it's the money that's talking, uh, no, me and Joe know each other for quite some time. <laughs> so I was looking through, and you get, I believe it's four infusions. Four infusions at level two that you know, that you could use. So I was looking through the infusions, which are on page 20, 21, and 22, and 23. There's, there's, a, lot, there's a few. And I was like, oh, hang on. Are you serious? So I can enhance a arcane focus and make it more powerful and give a plus one to it. You can. So if I was a spellcaster, which Artifice is a partly spellcaster, I'd be like, oh, 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 that's what I want. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, hang on. I can make a suit of armor or a shield, make a magical suit of armor and shield for myself. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh, I'm taking that one. And then I was like, oh, hang on. They've got enhanced weapon. Seriously? Really? Enhanced weapon? I can make magic weapons now? So now I would have taken that as well. And then I was like, mm, what else have we got here that doesn't have any kind of, you know, um, prerequisites? Because the prerequisites, we don't want to, we don't want to have to deal with that. And I was like, mm, what else is there? There, there, there? there could be something else. And I was very tempted to grab um, other things. And then I saw, oh, hang on, the homunculus servant. Well, I, I want the servant. <laughs> it just seems like it'd be too much fun to not have it. And is there a requirement for it? I just need to have a, a gem or a crystal worth 100 gold pieces. Oh, I could figure that out. No, it could be a problem. Oh, that's number four. <laughs> so for me, magic stone doesn't make any sense because I can do all these things. My arcane focus is going to be doing things better than anything that the magic stone's ever going to do. And so is any weapon that I've created that I want to use. So hence, I'm going with don't worry about magic stone. Yep, as a cantrip. Um, okay, so let's just quickly make sure I have uh, I've got through here. Fender, 
Mending is good as a battlesmith, I believe. It heals your steel defender. Ah, uh, does it? Okay, now, I did not look at the very specifics of the subclasses for the Artificer. Like I said, when I selected these, I chose them specifically for a very generic Artificer rather than a specific subclass of the Artificer. So there are some adjustments to be made. And um, I've already explained sort of my rationale for why I selected what I did. But thank you for that, Tarfender. I didn't go into quite that much level of um, research. I was just trying to build something that was more useful in terms of... Uh, oh, what's, what do you got here? Uh, Fender, I checked it. I checked it. That also heals the homunculus too. See, I'm not sure that I need to... I mean, how do they regain hit points? How do they regain hit points? Well, my feeling is that they're going to get their hit points back anyway. There must be a mechanic that allows you to do that. I can't imagine that Wizards of the Coast would come up and say, okay, here, we've got this really cool thing you can do that some people will love and will annoy other people, and guess what? You can't actually heal your Steel Defender or Homunculus. I'm sure that you can do that with the likes of, probably, Hit Dice. And, yep. I would imagine it would operate on the same in the same way, as far as I can tell. Yep. Yep, so here we go. On page 22 for the homun homunculus. The homunculus regains 2d6 hit points if the mending spell is cast on it. So that's a lot. If you or the homunculus dies, it vanishes, leaving its heart in its place. Okay, so in other words, it does a significant, significantly more. But, I guess my, my question would be, do we actually need it for the kinds of builds that we'd be using? I still feel like there are going to be ways of getting back those hit points for the, um, the creature, probably during a short rest, or certainly a long rest, just like any other monster would get back their hit points um, after a short rest or long rest. You know, short resting and long resting doesn't just apply to players' characters, it should also be applied to your monsters. Um, hence why I don't think that mending's a big deal. Um, but, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, d, d only 5e. Wait, how about steampunk guns and steampunk economy? Um, well, I wasn't really thinking. I mean, I was... Are you asking a question? I guess I'm just saying this is, you know, for me, more Eberron and more steampunky. Um, it's not really a question, as far as I can tell. Anyway, all right. Kanoko, hello, how's it going? Uh, Brian, how's it going? Um, guidance, Mending, and Mage Hand are probably your best bet. Uh, Prestidigitation is a runner-up, but um, Battlesmith also, also um, wands boom, Booming Blade. So, as I said, I, I selected the ones that were more generic rather than for a specific character build. Hence why I did not select them. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, West Coast Geeks. Although I have learned a bit more about the, um, the Battlesmith. Although I wasn't really planning to build a um, cantrip list for the Battlesmith as such. Uh, okay. Um, nice little group forming. Yep, that had happens. <laughs> Gentrific. Um I meant giving Magic Stone to another PC in your party. Yeah, I mean, that's fine, but I feel like Magic Stone isn't really going to be hugely... I mean, you, you might as well just use your magical spells and your ability to have a magical weapon to make an attack rather than cast a spell where, that you, where you can give a stone to one other person. Because Magic Stone doesn't do an awful lot of damage. It's pretty minimal. Um, and it's it's not, it's not a bad spell in the right circumstance at low level, but at high levels it's really, it doesn't really sort of it doesn't really work out as far as I can tell. That's why I never see very many people using it, and they usually want to trade it out later. That's what I tend to find with Magic Stone: is people who take Magic Stone use it at level one or two, and then they want to trade it out later. Uh, Fender, you got a question? Uh, do you still feel that the Artifice is too strong compared with the other classes? 
I think after seeing the fact that they have infusions at level two and what those infusions can do, given that just a single magical, magical weapon can unbalance the game if given out too soon, and frankly, most player characters don't need them. They will still be perfectly fine in Dungeons and Dragons 5e without any magical weapons. They'll be fine. Um, frankly, I, I don't want to see it in my game unless I was running Eberron or Steampunk. Because I've already done the, you know, um, let the players craft and construct whatever they want um, given criteria and conditions and so forth. And they've done that sort of thing. And at the end of it, I came to the conclusion that I had to end the, um, the campaign because it was driving me nuts. And the players were driving me nuts. And it, it just would steamroll and get worse and worse and worse. Now, that's not necessarily their fault. I think part of the fault uh, lies in the original design of Dungeons & Dragons 5e was you did not need to have magic items. They're not built into the mathematics. Therefore, you had to find them. The player base have been playing Dungeons and Dragons 4e, playing Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 Pathfinder, where they were dripping with magic items and they loved them all, and they were playing video games, and so you can't change that mindset in the player base just because you want to change that that condition. They were trying to go back to an older way of playing the game, and unless you can change change the culture and view of magic items, you really can't implement something like this. Now they have pretty much dumped their design philosophy as far as I can tell. Wizards of the Coast has pretty much taken their design philosophy that they started off with, that they were saying this is how we're going to do things, taken it, they stuck it in a box, they put a padlock on it, chucked it into the bottom of the sea and just let it go into the um, into a, a crevasse. And it's gone forever, as far as I can tell. So there's a very different way of doing things, which means dungeon masters are going to have to change completely everything in the monster manual. And I know this because I was in the part of the playtesters for the, for the monster manual, okay? <laughs> you can find, you, if you don't believe me, my name's in there as a playtester. It's not just a beta, but also the alpha. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay, um, Overboard DM. I agree with you about keeping the artifice in a special campaign setting, like Eberron. I see... I see. I told you I was. I always agree with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Joe. All right, that's cool. Um, West Coast geeks. I'm not sure what I what you're going to check out. I, I must have mentioned something that you thought was interesting. Maybe it's that um, the video because I did a video on how to use Minor Illusion in Mage Hand, and I am probably going to do Prestidigitation at some point. I'm still a little um, nervous about doing that particular topic because I want to get it right and I don't want to get um, shot down um, and then burnt, crash and burn. So I might wind up doing shape water, which I know sounds bizarre, but trust me, shape water as a cantrip is just unbelievably crazy. <laughs> and and I can I can just see it now. When people finally figure out what they can do with this particular little cantrip and they have a, and it's available on their spell list, that they are going to use it all the time. And uh, it'll be like being Sub-Zero. Or is, there's a female version called Frost, isn't there, as well, in Mortal Kombat. Um, it's a really good cantrip. Okay, what have you got here? Um, Brian, disagree about mending if you're in... Artillerist or a battlesmith. Yeah, as I said, it's not, it's not, I'm not looking at a specific subclass or build. Um, the Steel Defender and yeah, okay. Uh, West Coast Geeks, um, thinking about running an Eberron campaign. Are you, so are you thinking about running an Eberron campaign? I know I'm not. I know my players wanted me to because they wanted to bring in the Artificer and I, I'd already been down that route before. I, I didn't really want to do that again. It's a little bit like running the Curse of Strahd. I love the Curse of Strahd, but I won't run the Curse of Strahd again. Um, I know they've got a new book coming out, right? Um, Van Richten's, you know, the um, Domains of Dread book that's just been released, or not released, announced, um, which you couldn't buy because it went to bestseller and sold out on Amazon. It's only just been restocked now which I thought was crazy. 
and they have not normally they drop their price you know they normally it's like fifty dollars American and then they'll drop it down to about um, twenty nine ninety five and they haven't done that so they must be making people must be buying it so quickly that they feel they don't have to discount it I'm sure it will eventually happen I'll let you know when it does um, but yeah um, yeah not every every um, campaign setting is, is for me it's just how I see it uh, good conversation been listening to yeah I don't really watch YouTube I mostly listen nowadays <laughs> for those of you who are wondering reason being I'm usually working on stuff for the YouTube channel while I'm listening to somebody else's stuff and um, the list is well thought out Fred I didn't um, actually consider prestidigitation as a generic but I um, I feel the artifice already does many small fancy effects now I here's the thing you make a good point Fender I was I was I was so torn when I saw that ability you know the um, the class feature magical trink, um, tinkering <clears throat> and I was thinking man d this does quite a few things that prestidigitation kind of does as well maybe you don't need it and then I looked at it and then I thought about it and then I thought no the magical trinket is significantly weaker sorry, sorry the magical trinket is significantly weaker than prestidigitation and it is significantly more limited <clears throat> And I can see, um, and I, I guess people won't understand until I do the video on prestidigitation why I, I selected it, because there's such a wide range of things you can do with it that magical trinket doesn't cover. So for me, I looked at that and I thought, no, it's not going to be enough to be considered, you know, a complete drop it because of that. For me, um, it's still useful, and I think it's still useful because. The time frame for how long your trinket lasts is better than something like prestidigitation. So, hence, still useful, but prestidigitation does a lot more for me. Anyway, um, as a run-up cantrip, as a run-up, yeah, so, so here, here's the thing. Look, it is pretty clear, if with the right with the right type of character build that's specialized with specific subclass the right type of character build just about any cantrip can be the right cantrip to select <clears throat> but that's not what the topic of this video is about it's not to try to give you every single um, uh, calibration or list that would apply to every single type of build that's not what this video is about it's a generic one <clears throat> Any chance for a Rune Knight um, vid, Fred? Okay, well, Nick, um, well, a Rune Knight is in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And uh, I've already sat down with my friend, friend Simon, and we, we went over the, uh, what we, we went over the, we've already done Way of the Mercy Monk. Um, we did the Way of the Astral Self. I've got the notes, so I just haven't put the video together. And I think partly because I just about, sort of tarshed myself to death and I needed to take a break and um, I watched the analytics on the channel just dive bomb um, and I was like mm, I'm not feeling happy it's clear to, the, um, to me the viewers aren't that happy either maybe I will slow down a bit so you will see a video on the way of the astral self he still wants to talk about um, the blade singer because he wanted to play our blade singer in my campaign and I said I don't think so, because I saw the features and I, could, I knew right away what, what, what he could do with that. He assures me that he won't do that, but um, no. If I've got to let him do it, somebody else can, be let, um, can do it in the game, and then yeah, I'm not ready for that. So, we'll cover the Blade Singer. As for the, um, the Rune Knight, Nick, it'll happen. I just don't know what the time frame would be, Nick. Um, normally... To fast track stuff, patrons fast track it if they say this is like really important stuff. Now, to, to make it clear, for those of you who are unaware, um, Patreon, my patrons almost never request anything. Almost never request anything. And I think it's partly because I'm already doing what they wanted me to do in the first place. 
Um, and the other thing is that they're never too sure what I'm going to make. Um, because if you've watched the channel for a while, you know that from time to time, I come out with some videos that you probably have never seen anything like before. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why they don't necessarily specifically ask for anything. There has been, a, I think there was a request for a Curse of Strahd um, video on Irena, because I think that people keep getting confused about that. That's quite likely to happen pretty soon. Um, but the Rune Knight will eventually happen. It's just, there's like 22 subclasses, you know, 22, I mean, well, there's, probably, there's actually more. Um, but there's so much in Tasha's to cover. Uh, and I can't do that too quickly because, one, I'm not hugely invested in the subclasses stuff myself. And to give you an idea of the last video that I sat down and did, um, the first one took me four hours with Simon. That's just talking about the whole thing, writing down notes and figuring things out. The next one took me three hours. So they take that's just that's just the processing time. That's not the write it all up, get it all, get all my notes squared, check everything, that sort of stuff. Line up all this. I mean, it, it takes so much time. They have consumed much more of my time than anything else uh, trying to work through the subclasses because there's so much information, and because a lot of them are quite complicated and have implications that take a bit of time to sort of register. So they will definitely happen. Maybe just not yet. Um, I don't know if that's the answer you wanted, Nick, but that, I guess I've, I've given you as much information about what I'm doing. Okay, uh, moving through here. I'm almost at the bottom of the chat, which means I get to run away <laughs> um, and go and make some food. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> uh, uh, West Coast Geeks. That's cool about it. Yeah. Playtesting, yeah. So yeah, I think what'll what'll probably happen, I'm hoping what'll probably happen is eventually Wizards of the Coast will put out another monster manual or an updated monster manual to sort of contend with the new subclasses and features because I made so many changes. I, I frankly I can't see them being able to survive for too long before they have to make Dungeons and Dragons 5.5, which are essentially they already have. I mean, I know people disagree with me, but this is Dungeons and Dragons 5.5, okay? And it's already getting hard baked into the unearthed arcana and playtest material, which means that whether you want to use it or not, any of the new material is going to incorporate ideas from here. <clears throat> uh, okay. Okay, I'll do my best to keep up the um, West Coast geeks. Which West Coast are you from? I'm kind of curious. Because we have a West Coast, obviously, in New Zealand, but I imagine there's a West Coast in the States and a West Coast in the UK. I'm kind of curious as to which West Coast are we talking about. Um, <laughs> you don't have to answer that question, by the way. Uh, Janjvik. Um yeah, new Raven, um, um, Ravenloft setting book is uh, coming out. Yeah, I, I think that that particular book is going to easily wind up being one of the most popular books this year. I don't know what else they, they've got. We've got two more campaigns to be released, right? Two more campaigns are coming. And I think very likely the next one is going to be Dragonlance. I think it's highly likely that Spelljammer will be the next one after that. Could be wrong. Um, that's just this year. California, west coast of California. Aha! All right, you're in the States. Now I know. Okay, so given that that book pretty much has gone bestseller and sold out, before it had really properly been put up on Amazon, they got their, their shipment back in, the price has not dropped, it's selling really well already in terms of pre-orders. Now the same thing happened to Candlekeep Mysteries. So that's two books that went bestseller and sold out in the space of less than a day on Amazon, which is just bat crazy. 
So I would imagine that this year is going to be quite tough for people because there's going to be so many books that are going to be incredibly enticing. And that new book they've just discussed, you know, um, Van Richten's book is going to be like one of the books that you want to have, I would imagine. I haven't seen it yet, but I would imagine, given the content, it's going to be one of the books you want to have. And the thing with Candlekeep Mysteries is because it's a collection of 17 short adventures, which we've almost everybody has been trying to tell them, look, stop making the big campaigns and just give us a whole lot of short adventures in these books, and we will put them together the way we want to. They finally did that, and it's completely obvious. I mean, you know, Tales from the Yawning Portal did not sell like that Candle Keep book, and neither did um, Ghosts of Salt Marsh. None of those sold anywhere like this new Candle Keep Mysteries. So if they keep following the pattern that they've been doing, I can see there being at least four, three campaign books and one adventure book that easily most Dungeon Masters are going to want to have in their, in their collection. And as always, I'm sure they will try to put enough stuff in there to entice players to buy those books as well. Um, just in case their Dungeon Master doesn't want to buy the book themselves. <laughs> it happens. Um, or can't afford to. I mean, it gets expensive after a while. Okay, I'm almost to the bottom. Okay, um, thank you, Troy. I'm glad you like the, uh, the videos. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, for those of you who don't know, somebody was uh, left a comment today that I answered, and he was commenting on one of the videos I had done, sitting under a tree at, a, at, at the beach reserve, and saying how he liked the green screen. And I had just had to laugh, because I, I knew what he was getting at. And um, you're going to see more of those videos. As long as the weather stays fine, I'm going to keep doing them because I enjoy doing them outside. Um, and sitting under the tree is better than sitting in this office. So, so uh, he was commenting about the green screen being, you know, really impressive. And I made up some bollocks um, and had tried to have a bit of a laugh about the whole thing. But um, yeah, I don't know why I didn't do it sooner. Um, well, actually, I do know why. It's the sound and the wind, and the other things, and people being around. That's always been the biggest issue to filming outside, because it's a lot easier to control it in an office, even if I, if you've got an office that's a fishbowl. <laughs> um, Fender, I kind of want a video about the Swarm Keeper, because I think it's very fun, subclass, um, but yeah, just like you said, um, I feel like you already do videos I like. Yeah, yeah, and Fender, you are uh, you are a patron, so you can just go to the patron page and just put down a request for it, and I will try to fast track it. Um, I've tried not to push Simon. I'm not trying to push my my friend into doing videos he doesn't want to do on, because he he knows much more than I do. So for me to do those videos, I really need Simon's help, um, and so so that he'll keep doing them. I let him select the topic. <laughs> there is some, <laughs> there's some logic to, to the way I do things, okay? If you want to get somebody to help you do something, you let them do it the way they want to do it, so you get it done. It will eventually get done, just not necessarily the way you'd want it done. I have, I'm, I'm itching to cover the two cleric subclasses, the Twilight and the Peace, because they are one of the most just bat crazy classes under the sun. They really are. They're absolutely bat crazy. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know that. Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily going to happen in the time frame I want. They are releasing a book on Dragonlance. I'm pretty sure. I don't think it's been. There's a, a novel being released on Dragonlance, but a campaign setting. I think that's what's going to be the next campaign setting to be announced sometime this year. There's supposed to be two more campaign settings announced. And we've had our first one. That's the Domains of Dread one. Uh, is there a limited ed edition? Um, I believe there is a limited ed edition on um, Van Richten. Uh, I just haven't been able to find a picture. 
I'll tell you what, I, if I can find a picture, I'll put it up on the community tab of uh, the YouTube channel. So you can find it and you can see it. I'll try and get a very good image of it. Um, and I'll try to do that today, if I can. If I can do that, I'll put that up so you can see it. I think that's what you're talking about, Ajo, is the, um, the limited ed edition cover for the Van Richten book. So, yeah, so Dragonlance, here we come. Yeah, well, I think that's part of the reason why the dispute between Margaret and Tracy and Wizards of the Coast got settled, or Hasbro, because they had this campaign setting coming out, and it was probably going to be bad press to sort of burn, you know, the creators of Dragonlance. I don't think that many people would have forgiven them, and it may well have hurt their sales. Um, and, you know, if we do see Dragonlance as a campaign setting, which I think it's very, very likely, uh, it is, it's just going to sell out in less than a day. Again, another book that'll just go like that. Fender, I hope the Candlekeep book is the start of uh, what the, the next books are going to, to look like from now on. I do too, but I don't think that's likely. Um, so Chris Perkins, which we haven't really seen an awful lot of recently, he must be working pretty hard, has made it quite clear that he likes the he wants to make stories that are big, long, expansive, epic you know, campaigns. In other words, he's trying to create something that will live in the memory of people rather than people's memory going back to what Gary Gygax made. Because when you think of Dungeons and Dragons, if you've been playing for a long time, you tend to think more about the kinds of adventures that Gary built and not about a lot of the other stuff that's come after that. And I guess to shape your, 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 your part in history, that is really what he's been trying to do, is shape his, his place in history. Because he will retire. I think he is going to consider retiring pretty shortly. <clears throat> anyway, um, moving on from that speculation. Um, I love Ghost of Salt Marsh, great adventure. Yeah, I don't think it's a bad adventure. Um, I, 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 I toyed. I put it up as an option for the, my players. Did they want to play through that? Uh, in the end, they decided um, no. You know, they, they told me what they wanted, and I picked the adventure I thought would produce what they wanted. And, um, and I think uh, Dragon of Ice Spire Peak and Dungeon of the Mad Mage is probably, those two adventures are probably going to deliver what my players had asked for. I wonder if I've got my books around. What? Because I, I did a brainstorm. I don't often um, um, open my book and, uh, and read out some of the stuff in here. Maybe I should do that before I leave because I've got two minutes, don't I? Um, Brian, what do you got here? Twilight and the Peace are overpowered. And if you have both of them in the same group, it's uh, nearly unplayable. So hard for the DM. Yeah, well, it's not unplayable for the players. They'll love it. Um, but the Dungeon Master won't be able to contend. I know what you're talking about, Brian. Yeah. Trent Monk has actually gone over the, the combination of having a, uh, a Twilight Domain and a Peace Domain Cleric in the same party. And they have some features that can synergize and they make things very difficult. Here we go. Here's my book. This is my little um, my notebook that I have that I use for constructing information for my players. And I did my session zero. I'm just looking through my session zero. What did I write down for my session zero? Oh, I'll talk about that some other time. Um, but a lot of people have been asking me, you know, they want to hear a bit more about uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage and I guess some of the stuff that I do. I don't really share that sort of thing. Frankly, I don't think people are really give a toss um, ultimately. But very quickly before I go, um, I, I wrote down all the things that they, they said that they wanted. They, they wrote down Knight Errant. Um, they, didn't, they said absolutely no more giants, thank you very much. They had enough of giants. They wanted pirates. Um, they wanted to be uh, nobles or even better, be able to become nobles, work their way through or earn that privilege in some way. They wanted a sea vessel. Uh, there was a question mark about whether that might be a flying ship as well or 
a flying ship and a sea vessel. Um, they wanted plane, a tra plane travel or planar travel. They wanted to be able to go to different worlds. They wanted a coastal town um, and an inland inland town that they came and that they were sort of interact with. So we're using Ghosts of Salt Marsh. So we're using Salt Marsh and we're using Fandolin as the two towns they tend to interact with. Of course, they go to the cities as well. They wanted Spelljammer. Uh, they wanted magic shops. I have magic shops, but I have, I have. To be fair, the individual who runs the magic shop, she's a bit hard for them to deal with. Um, <laughs> but I do have a magic shop, but it doesn't sell anything they want. It sells some stuff, just not everything. Uh, one of the things they did say that the, my my group said, look. We want in a campaign where there's many different powerful villains. So that is what I focused on. Rather than one overarching villain, although I do kind of have that, there are lots and lots of villains in this campaign that are working against them. Um, that they may not be aware of just yet, but they will eventually. <laughs> they wanted a home base. Uh, currently, they're in the process of rebuilding Tresendar Manor, which is on the outskirts, just on the outskirts of Phandalin. Um, that's as a, as a result of, you know, playing through Dragon of Spire Peak. And I think they decided they were going to, had a gambling game and they won the deed to the, the manor. Um, and so they've been rebuilding it. They're halfway, they've spent half the money to get the rebuild done and they're partway through the rebuild. Um, they wanted to travel to many different worlds. That's plan of travel again. Bounty hunters, there was a discussion about being um, somebody wanting to be a bounty hunter, so I wrote that down. Um, they said they didn't want to have a patron. They didn't want to have somebody who told them what to do. They said, we want to do what we want to do. So we will give ourselves our own quests. And I thought, okay, so they need to be in a position where they can do that. So in the end, we decided that they would wind up being the constables and deputies of the town of Fandolin. They're probably going to wind up outgrowing that eventually. Um, but they did specify they did not want somebody they had to answer to. That was not something they wanted in the game. Um, and yes, they talked about the land deed for the manor. Yes, um, they wanted, that's right, they wanted to expand the town and their earnings. So they wanted to be able to make Fandolin a larger location and they wanted to have a way of creating income rather than just going adventuring. And there was a discussion about being a bit more free about where they could go. So I've left them in their hands. They get a lot of downtime as a result of all of this. Um, and uh, it's working out pretty well so far. Yeah. Uh, what, do, what do you got here, Fender? Um, I am curious about Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Thinking of running that in a couple of months. Okay, so I'll really quickly I'll say that I feel like the first level of Dungeon of the Mad Mage um, was a bit disappointing. Uh, frankly, I was a little disappointed when I think about Under Mountain in the first level because I've I've run um, the halls of Under Mountain. You know, when a Dungeons and Dragons 4E was a thing. Um, and I feel like the villain was much more impressive than what we get in the first layer of Dungeon of Mad Mage. So I had to make some adjustments. Okay, as a result of that, I made some adjustments. And I will probably talk about that at some point. There are really two different... Um, factions operating within there um, and, and frankly I think the best aspect of it has definitely been the intellect devourers there's been multiple intellect devourers it has caused them untold stress and trouble um, to the point of, of hilarity uh, that is probably the best aspect of the first layer the second layer I see problems with that in that I don't feel like there's a climactic aspect to that level, um, which is weird because usually, you know, each level 
has a you know like a, a boss fight or a um, a main climactic aspect to it. It's not just we explore, we explore, we find stuff, we kill monsters, we negotiate with them, we trick them, or we try to um, hire them and make them part of our army. Um, yes, my players have been doing that. Um, so yeah, it's a little it's a little odd. I there are some I am I am torn about um, how it is. I do feel like you will have to make adjustments. Yeah, so West Coast Geeks, you felt the same way about um, the, ma um, the Mage? Yeah, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, is it needs tweaking. I really does, because it, it doesn't have enough punch. I really wanted uh, to punctuate each level with something, and, and it doesn't feel like it has that. Okay, <clears throat> I've talked enough. I should go. You guys have got better things to do. There's a whole bunch of you probably itching to go and watch, um, what is it? Uh, critical Role? Um which I understand. That's cool. So we've answered all the questions. Thank you to everybody who showed up. So wherever you are in the world, whether you be um, in my part of the world or another part of the world, whether it's the morning, the night, the afternoon, or the early morning, please look after yourself, your family, and your friends. Be nice to your neighbours. And hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s.